Hey y'all, welcome to our section perspective demo for the Fieldhouse project. I'm gonna take you through some of the basic steps that you need to do to make a section perspective in Rhino. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing you'll need to do, of course, is the project. Go ahead and get everything that you wanna have in there, in there. And I'll show you the way that this project works um, because it having more stuff in your project is gonna make help you, you know, decide where to cut your section and what you wanna show. So the way that mine works is I've got this kind of party of, uh, it's, it's based on the drawer full of crumpled up paper scraps that I have in my in my workshop here, where it's kind of this, this building sliding out of another building, sliding out of the roof and the kind of a crumpled up looking origami-ish type roof because this is architecture school. So we have to have something kind of funky. I mean, we don't actually, but I kind of wanted to. Um, and the way that this project works is that if I start going through and turning off some stuff here, is it's a very, uh, I think it's a very straightforward floor plan. It's almost totally symmetric. Um, I forgot to add the mechanical and electrical spaces as one always does uh, in this project. So uh, I added it as an electrical annex and a little mechanical basement. Uh, and the way that this works is I've got kind of my my doors and showers and stuff modeled in there. And I've got some lockers in there that are a little funny. Uh, everyone gets their own little seat. And I've got a big kind of timber structure here for my covered recreational area where I envision us playing bicycle polo. Uh, I've got this secondary roof here that's uh, suspended or that's held up by this, this other wall here, which also forms the uh, exit or entrance. And also it's held up by this little um, electrical uh, alcove up there, but it's also mostly held up by all these little cable trusses that help hold up the other part of the structure and this thing here. And so I wanna have all this showing in my section perspective. So I went ahead and modeled it all. And then uh, a little corrugated roof. And last but not least, a ladder. And let me talk about the ladder because I like the ladder and I also forgot to give the janitor somewhere to go up and take care of the electrical and mechanical stuff. And I wanted to show this ladder in my section perspective. So this is going to be where I'm going to cut my section perspective and I'll show you how to do that. So having a lot of stuff in your project will help you decide where to do this. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to do what you normally do to do a perspective. And well, you could just cut your whole model in half, which sometimes is is worth doing, but this is not one of those times. So you're gonna use the command called clipping plane. And it's gonna ask you to draw it. And I like to use the 3.1 and you're gonna select some surface that is oriented in the direction that you want to clip your model in. So it's gonna be parallel to the clipping plane. And this is going to draw the clipping plane so that it, it, it slices parallel to that surface, right? So if I select it, then I can move it around and it'll adjust where this cut is, right? Well, that's great. So the only thing about that is that if you have a model that doesn't have a flat surface in the direction that you want to cut this clipping plane, which does have, or cut, use the clipping plane, it, which does happen sometimes, then the most convenient solution there and is to just draw a box that is in the right shape. And I've already done that and put it on its own layer. I don't turn the site on too, by the way. Cool. So then when I do the clipping plane, and I do my three point, I can just select the face of this box knowing that it's in the right direction. And I might have to flip it. And then I can adjust it so that it's in the right spot. So like I said earlier, I wanted to catch this ladder in my section perspective, right? And since I planned a little bit, uh, I already knew that. So what I did was uh, I went ahead and I made a little marker for myself so that I can always select the same spot when I put my clipping plane there. And this is helpful because oftentimes it, I mean, you'll find that you might need to cut the, make this view a couple of different times, um, either because you wanna render it sometimes with shadows or sometimes without, or sometimes you might wanna render it with the ISO curves on and some stuff you don't want that to be showing on because it's just too much information. Um, so it's really it's really smart to save your view. Um, and one easy way to do that though, the other thing is that when you're using a clipping plane is you need to save the clipping plane location. 
So having a little marker that you can always go to that'll put the clipping plane in the right spot is a, is a smart move. So again, if I run the clipping plane command, first corner of the rectangle goes there and there and there, and it put it in the wrong direction. So I'll just simply select the clipping plane. I've actually got two in here from a previous attempt at this demo. So I'm just gonna not select that. So that clipping plane is in the same spot. I can flip the direction. So there's a command here that I'm gonna talk about here and it's enable and disable clipping plane. Um, and sometimes when you've got two, when you activate two different viewports here, so you have, what I've done is I've accidentally activated two different viewports with the same name and the Rhino doesn't know which one to activate, the, which of these two active viewports to activate the clipping plane in. So if you're having problems with the clipping plane, then check your clipping plane properties and make sure you don't have too many viewports with the same name. So what I'm gonna do really quickly is because I'm in the ISO view on what used to be the front um, viewport, I'm just gonna go ahead and reset this view back to the front. And now I've got my standard little selection of, of views. Okay, cool. So back to what I was talking about. That, but I, I think that's probably, I'm not gonna edit that out because that does happen a lot and it's a common question. Okay, so if I go to the clipping plane, right, which I put on this box, which is in the right spot, that's always gonna give me this little cutout of this um, of this ladder access hole, which is where I want it. Then now that I've got my model you know, clipped in the right spot, then I need to go ahead and get my uh, section perspective view done. So I know that if I go to the front plane, because my model is conveniently, if I go to the top, I can see that my model is conveniently placed orthogonally so that that front view, which is in this direction, is going to be, if I go to the front viewport, then I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna get that view, right? Now, the problem is that one, my model might not always be rotated in such a way that one of the standard Rhino viewports is going to give me this uh, section cut that I want. And that and that's okay, because there's an easy way around that. Um, but well, there's two ways. You can just rotate your entire model in the site and all the stuff, which is perfectly fine. Or what you can do is you can use a command in Rhino uh, called um, orient camera to surface, which is a long uh, command, but I'll show you how that works real quick, is if perchance my model is rotated, like let's pretend this box is my model and it's in the wrong direction, uh, or not the wrong direction, but it's just a non-orthogonal direction, then what I can simply do is use that orient camera command, which is right here, orient camera to surface. And I just select the surface of this box and it's gonna ask me which direction I want the camera to face. And I probably want it to face the other direction. So I say flip and okay and now you can see it's cutting my model in that direction so if your stuff's not straight now this looks crooked because my model is 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 orthogonal but you can see how you can use this command to orient the camera and cut the section in uh, rhino in a view that is not one of your standard orthogonal viewports okay cool so i did it in the wrong direction but the camera the command works the same either way okay so back to what we were talking about. So let's go back to my safe view, my ISO view here. Let's go back to the clipping plane, activate it in this viewport. Okay, sometimes you have to reactivate the, the clipping plane when you reset the viewport, which is just how it goes. Okay, so I've got the view that I want, right? So I'm gonna to go to the front view and I'm gonna make sure that in the clipping plane properties, the clipping plane is enabled in the front view. Sometimes it's not, in which case you won't get a section, but in this case you will. So um, the first thing you'll probably notice is that in the standard uh, orthogonal viewpoints, this is not a section perspective. This is just a regular section. So what you need to do is just click somewhere in the gray space of the viewport and in your viewport properties, reset the projection from parallel to perspective. And it's just that simple. And now you've got a section perspective, right? Now this one is a little bit of a subtle one because it's a very long model and it's set with a lens length of 50. So I'm getting, you can see that I'm clearly getting a, um, a perspective view 
And I can, so I can move that around by using my scroll wheel of my mouse to zoom in and out or by holding down shift and using the right mouse key. I, can, I don't even need it. Yeah, I need to hold down shift when I do that to spin it. So if I spin it out of control by accident, which can happen if I'm not in the, um, once I change this viewport property to perspective, then I'm no longer constrained to just slide around and the, it's gonna let me rotate the model again, which is gonna be a little bit of a mess if I'm trying to cut a section. So I can simply go back to view, I can reset my view back to the front, I'm in the right spot again, hold down shift, drag, but to, because I've reset the view, I'm in parallel again. So I need to make sure that I am in perspective when I go back to it. Okay, cool. Now, so if I want to adjust it, I hold down shift and use the right mouse, right mouse button to pan around like this or to drag it a little bit. And then if I want to change the lens length because I want a more dramatic uh, section perspective view, then I can maybe change this to something like 25 and I've got a more wide angle lens. And what I might have to do yeah, it's not going to let me zoom in anymore, which is okay. All I need to do is I just reset the camera. Zoom selected. And now I can zoom to my heart's content. Cool. Again, always remember, if the camera starts being a jerk, then you can either change your viewport properties to parallel, but you don't want to do that in this case because you're trying to cut a perspective. In which case, plan B is just use the zoom selected command and it'll reset your camera. Okay, so let's say that this is the view that I want and you can fine tune your view either by uh, adjusting your camera manually in the, um, in the properties box or by using your control or command key to, to um, do a finer version of the zoom command than your scroll wheel will allow. Okay. Cool, so let's say that this is the view that I know that I want. Well, then that's fine. What I can do is I'll go and I'll just make myself a saved view of it or a named view. Um, I've got a shortcut down here in my uh, viewport name view panel. I can just hit the plus down here, but if you don't have that set up, then the long way to do that, which is still not very long, is just to go to view and it's going to be set view and the named views, and it's gonna open this dialog box. Actually, it's gonna open the dialog box that I already had open. So view, set view, named views. Now it's gonna open a dialog box, which will probably pop up on your screen if you don't have your thing already open. And you can name this section perspective one. Cool, so now, if I go back to it, then I can recall it. Now, again, if it doesn't call the section, uh, you may have to reactivate the clipping plane and then uh, toggle it in this view, but for now it's working just fine. Cool, so I've got my view, right? So now I'm gonna do my make 2D, control A, and then run the make 2D command. Okie doke, and it's gonna cook for a minute. and it's gonna dump it right in the middle of the top view. Cool. So if I go to the top viewport, and there's my section perspective. So that all seems easy enough, and for the most part, it is. Um, the only thing that is a little bit of a problem is that when you do come into AI and you export it in that, lit, in that way, straight after doing a Make 2D in Rhino, then what's gonna happen is your layers in AI are just gonna be just garbage. Uh, so that is okay if you've got a really simple model and you can pretty easily edit the line weight in bulk um, or just you know math select stuff and then go into your stroke thing and do a more reasonable line weight and that looks pretty good. But if I wanna be uh, a little bit more precise about it, which sometimes I might wanna be, then what I wanna do is I think it would be great is if I had like in Rhino, all of my layers really well organized where I could just select big groups of line, way, of, of line work um, and adjust things by group. So the way that I'm gonna do that is I'm going to organize my layers in Rhino so that when I do my export selected, then I can uh, maintain those source layers and open up my AI file and have all those layers still, still intact. 
So I'm going to talk about how to do that real quick. And again, this isn't something that you necessarily have to do. I like doing it though, because in instances like this model where there's just a lot of individual lines and it's hard to select them, then it makes life a little bit easier. So in Rhino, when you do a make 2D, it creates a new layer called make 2D and it dumps all the line work onto that layer. And it creates a sub layer called visible. And I think there's a, if you select the hidden lines option, then there's another layer called invisible or hidden or something. Um, and then on that visible layer, it puts all of this line work from your stuff. And what it does is it creates another sub layer for all of the different categories of line work that's based on the layers of your original stuff. So just to explain that one more time, I had all of my original model really well organized onto these layers. And when I did a make 2D, then Rhino made make 2D layers for the original layers that have the original line work on them. Now, sometimes this does not work properly. Um, it depends on the options that you check, but uh, the way to make sure that the original line work ends up on the associated make 2D layer is if you, when you do your make 2D and just, I'm gonna select a random thing and just say make 2D. Then I select in my options, the maintain source layers object properties. Cause what that'll do is uh, on my make 2D layers, then uh, my original line work will be tied to that. So for example, in my make 2D, I've got a layer for each individual uh, original layer. And if I click on like, let's say timber, well, you can see all my timber curves turn on and off, um, which is really handy. Now, if you don't select that option, then what it's gonna do is it's gonna kind of put all that stuff on the top layer a lot of times, and that's okay. We can still organize it, but it takes a little bit more time. Now, the problem is that as we just noted, when I select all this stuff and I export it to AI, it does not maintain all the sub layers. It only just does it all on this kind of make 2D layer or the, it's the visible layer. And then it doesn't continue to propagate all the sub layers down there. So what we need to do is we need to create, um, if we wanna, again, have these layers come into AI, then we need to make fresh top layers and we will export it that way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a new layer and it's just gonna be called something like 2D timber. And what I can do is I can select all my timber stuff, right? And move it to that layer. Now I can conveniently do that because Rhino already organized it for me in this make 2D thing by simply clicking on the timber layer, right clicking and say, um, select objects, right? And it's gonna select all the objects on my timber layer. And I'm simply going to move those to my new 2D timber layer, right? And what's really handy is if you just kind of turn these layers off as you go, then it helps to make sure that you uh, stay organized. So if I make another layer, for example, called like, I don't know, uh, 2D concrete. And then I go to my, uh, Rhino stuff and, or my make 2d stuff rather. And I click on the concrete layer. And again, I say select objects. Then I can move all that concrete stuff to my new 2d concrete layer and so forth and so on. And again, I'll turn this layer off and I can keep going until I run out of line work and it's all organized. Um, that's how I organize this process anyway. So eventually what's going to happen after a few minutes, I will end up with, uh, all of these new layers, uh, that are up on, up on the top level of my Rhino, Rhino model, and I'll export them to Illustrator that way, and I'll show you how that looks. So now after I've gone through and I've organized all of my line, my 2D line work onto individual layers, which again, you don't have to do this. This is only if you want your AI file to be super well organized. Then um, what I can do is I can now select this stuff Again, this, all this stuff is on nicely organized layers, right? So if I turn my timber off, it's all my timber lines. So I select all this file and then export selected and I'll do the AI export, right? And so then when I take it into AI, it's gonna open up and it's gonna look like this. So see here now, I've got these really tidy AI layers. And when I go in here, what I can do is I can go ahead and I can just lock all this stuff, right? And then whenever I want to adjust one of these layers in bulk, I can just unlock it, control A, 
and then reset the line weight for that one layer. And that's really handy if I want to do something like reset the set all the truss line work to, you know, I don't know, maybe that doesn't quite look right. And I want to decrease the line weight of just that one layer. And then I want to go through my, you know, and I can do this layer by layer. And so maybe my, um, or sorry, those are my trusses, those are my timber. And I can lock that then. If I want to do my trusses, I'll unlock my trusses and do control A and say, maybe I want those to have a thicker line weight. So like 0.3 or something. Nope, not quite. 0.5, eh, too much. Sure, close enough. Well, still not quite right. But again, you can see I can iterate it really, really easily. And it's very simple. And now when I unselect it, like I don't have to bother with going back if I want to, you know, if I want to continue to tweak this or if I get through, you know, half of this and decide that I want to change the way that my line weights are, I don't have to go back and select individual stuff over and over again. I can just select entire groups of things and just continue to easily adjust it by simply unlocking that layer and doing a select all, which is why I like this. So then without a whole lot of effort, then what I can do is I can, after fiddling with these line weights for a while, I can arrive at a section that looks really, I think, pretty tidy without a whole lot of, you know, just endlessly adjusting line weights, um, which I think is, I think is handy. Um, when you have something like this with just a ton of line work, I think it's worth organizing that stuff up front so you can easily tweak it later. So one of the things that I mentioned, or at least had intended to mention earlier in this tutorial, is the idea of using the saved view to uh, re-render the same image in multiple different styles and to combine them to add more depth to your rendering. So let me talk about that for a second. So right here, we've got the make 2D line work that we've already seen, right? So one of the things that I can do if I wanna do things like capture whatever the shadows are going to be, or that kind of, or any kind of textural or rendering data that I don't get through just the make 2D line work, is that I can take the line work and, well, I've already got the line work in the other file, so we've already seen that. So what I can do is I can go back to my original view, right? And I can change this to um, some view, right, where I've got this shadow information. And then what I can do also is, is I can adjust my, um, my rendering properties in a way, and I've already set this up a little bit, but you know, I can turn the sun on and off if I want to adjust the sun settings to get just the kind of the right amount of, of sunlight that I can turn on manual control and I can do things like, you know, adjust the position of the sun here and all that stuff and say apply and that's fine. And that's all well and good. And then what I can do here is, so I've got this image that, um, Remember, because it's a saved view, it's going to be exactly the same view that you use to make your make 2D line work. So it, um, it should line up perfectly if you want to combine the two. So the way to do that is you can and take this view and you can just, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the clipping plane settings here and I'm going to turn off show edges because what I want is I want just the I don't want all those clipping plane intersections to show up because um, what I want to what I want to do is grab this image and combine it with the image of the line work that I have. Um, though this in and of itself is is also probably a pretty usable section perspective, but I don't. It's it gets really hard to see what's going on when I lose all that line work information. So what I want to do is I want to combine the two, right? So what I could do is I could render it and then save the rendering, and that would look really nice. But the way to do it even faster, again, this is a lower quality version of this technique, um, it, but it, it does work in a pinch or it could be just fine for the final product if we're gonna do a whole bunch of post-processing and we don't need a super high res, super accurate version of the rendering anyway. So what I'm gonna do is go to view and go to capture to file. And what this is, is it's basically a screenshot in Rhino, um, although it's, a higher resolution than an actual screenshot because when you do you know an actual screenshot you're just getting the resolution of your computer's screen and what we what we want to do is we want to save this image here but at a higher resolution than what's on the screen so um, normally the default scale of the of this thing is one uh, but what I'm going to do instead is change this to a scale of like I don't know four because I know that the AI artboard that I'm working with is 20 by 20, and that seems about about right. It might be three, that's probably big enough. Anyway, it just doesn't matter that much because there's not a lot of color in this image and it's pretty low quality. So I'm gonna say apply, and it's gonna save, and I'm just gonna let it save to, I was gonna say, um, 
shadows. And I'm going to save it to this place because I know where that is. And it's going to cook for a minute. Oh, and you can uh, do it with the transparent background too, which is actually probably a lot smarter um, if you're going to do things like add a sky or things like that. Um, then you can export it from from AI without any other line work other than the building and then drop all sorts of stuff in the background and foreground really easily. But for the purposes of this demonstration, the technique is the same. Just remember that you can use this transparent background. So it's going to cook for a second. And now what we can do is go back into Illustrator and go to File and Place, which is currently grayed out because I have this active, this new layer that I made for the um, for the background image uh, deactivated. But uh, if I activated it, now I've already placed it on here, so I can go to File and Place, and I can drop that image on that layer, which I've already done, uh, and then I'll drag that layer behind all of the line work, right? And so then what I can do is after I've got it kind of scaled, which for the purposes of this tutorial, I've already tweaked it a little bit. I've scaled it to the right size and then I can go ahead and line it up with this image here, right? <laughs> that looks pretty close. Yeah. And then what I've did, what I've got is I've got all my nice line work, uh, which I can then I can still continue to tweak all this line work so that it's just perfect. And then I've also got all of the shading and the shadow information behind it. And then what else? The other thing that I might want to do is this is kind of a little bit heavy-handed, I think, with the background imagery. So what I might do is just click on that picture, and in the appearance tab, I might drop it to like two thirds opacity or something like that. And I think that looks really nice. Yeah, that looks good to me. So there you go. That's how you can add even more content to your section perspectives. Uh, so you have line weight, and you have shadows, and you have all sorts of other stuff. And then again, if you export this as a PNG instead of a JPEG and enable the transparent background, then you'll also be able to easily Photoshop in stuff behind it. And you can already Photoshop in stuff easily in front of it. And that's that for now.